So I'm going to take you back in time to the absolute worst moment of my life. But if you stick with me, it has a happy ending. So I laid bleeding on a table, and I looked up at my doctor, and I said to him, I, ca I can't die. My babies are only two and four years old. I can't die. You know, this is the second time in about two weeks that he had prodded this growing anomaly in my breast. And the first time that he did this, I also lay in a pool of my own blood, dripping down off the table onto the floor. And although he and I had not discussed the specifics of my diagnosis, I had taken it upon myself to try and figure out everything I could about what might be going on. And I had all but convinced myself that I had a very deadly cancer that would soon end my life. I just wanted any reassurance from him. I wanted so badly for him to say, no, you're wrong, no, 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 this is nothing. But instead, he turned away from me, and he faced the wall, and he said, there will be somebody else there to raise your children. My babies were only two and four at the time, and it was awful to think that there would be somebody else there to raise them. I took these pictures so that they would have some memory of me because they were too little to remember, right? I wanted them to remember who I was. I thought that was the most important thing. I don't know to this day how I mustered the strength to pull myself off that table and walk out, but I did, right? And here I am with all of you here today. And my baby. My babies who were so small, right? You saw how small they were. They're now 10 and 13 years old. And I, who was so scared in that moment of time, am now leading the world's, the world's largest biomedical research study focused on this disease that was supposed to end me eight years ago. You know, but somehow, I will always be stuck in that moment of time. It will never let me go. I will always be there with my husband, thinking of what it would be like for him to raise those babies all by himself. Nobody should have to do that. Nobody should ever have to call their parents and tell them that they only have six months to live. That is something nobody should have to go through. So I decided I was going to live. That was the determination that I made. I'm a scientist, and at this time, when I found that lump in my breast, I was only a couple months away from receiving a PhD in biochemistry. And I thought, if anybody has a shot, if anybody can do this, find a path to an unknown place that needed scientific information, it would be me. And so I turned to the scientific literature, and I looked for any clue I could to help me forge, forge that, that road ahead. And what I found was awful and depressing. I found individual case reports of long-term survivors who lived an entire year with this disease. That is not all inspiring. It certainly does not give you confidence. I found this awful graph in the literature. This is a survival curve, okay? And it took 40 years for this institution to collect enough data on my exceedingly rare cancer in order to generate that curve, right? I was diagnosed with angiosarcoma, which is a cancer that starts in the lining of your blood vessels. Only about 300 people a year get this disease, and more times than not, it's fatal, okay? So when I saw this graph, which was basically the only data that I could find, I felt this unbelievable sense of vertigo staring down that graph. Every single time you see a notch going down, it's a patient dying. I was not going to survive this disease. Not only was I not going to survive, but nobody who ever got this disease would live because nobody would ever pick up the gauntlet and study something that only affects a handful of people. I knew that. I knew that intellectually. And it was awful. It was unconscionable to me. I knew that I couldn't wrap my brain around this intellectually, and that I had to go and figure out a new way to move toward a more holistic approach. 
I couldn't champion this scientifically, but I still needed something desperately. I needed to make a human connection. I needed somebody to tell me that even though none of this was okay, it's going to be okay. I needed that so badly. So I searched for other survivors online, and I found them. They were there. They were looking too. They needed the same thing that I needed. I'd reach out to them, and they would never reply to me. And I got that sinking feeling. And I would put their names back into the search engine, and I would add the word obituary, and their names would pop up every single time. They were already gone. And every single time that happened, it was as though a black hole opened up right next to me and sucked in every ray of hope. In a last ditch effort, I went to social media, right? probably the last place that a scientist would go in order to try and figure out anything about their disease. I typed the words angiosarcoma cancer into Facebook. And to my great surprise, there they were, all nine people living with this disease. <laughs> They all were in this Facebook group started by this woman, Lauren Ryan, and I swear when I stumbled on that group, it was as though she had reached right through the computer screen and wiped the tears of relief right off of my face. It was unbelievable. They were alive, all of them. They were talking about what it was like to have this disease. You know, They told me to buy this shirt right here that I'm wearing. I had no idea I needed to even ask what shirt to wear after I had a mastectomy, but they told me you need something that buttons down the front because you won't be able to extend your arms. They told me things I didn't even know I needed to know. They basically housed the world's understanding of this disease, and they were stay-at-home mothers. They were artists. They were historical interpreters. They were a cross-section of humanity, just like you and just like me, who happened to get slammed by this awful diagnosis. And because of the rarity of it, they all funneled into the same tiny little space, and they came together to help each other. Lauren and I quickly became like sisters. Right? We knew each other in ways you can't possibly know another person. We decided that we were going to take this disease down, even if it took us out. We were going to do everything we could that distilled to one perfectly pure thought, to live. And if it wasn't going to allow us to live, we wanted somebody else to live, anybody. It didn't even matter at that point. So we co-founded a nonprofit organization called Angiosarcoma Awareness. And together with other people from that same tiny little group, we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars and spread it across a number of different labs. And they published on angiosarcoma. And we felt so good about ourselves, right? Who wouldn't feel good about themselves? But the tricky thing is if you actually take a step back and you ask yourself the really hard question, is it going to make a real difference? Is it going to have true and lasting impact? Is it going to save somebody's life to have a couple of papers out in the literature? The sad reality is no. In fact, Lauren died a few short months later. She died after a terrible recurrence of this disease. It was awful. I sat with her at her deathbed, and I massaged her swollen legs, and I, I read her unbelievable messages from people in that group whose lives she forever changed. And although she was dying, and she knew it, and although she was in excruciating pain, she had such a warm smile on her face. She knew. When I walked away from her for the very last time, I had to carry on her legacy. I had to make sure that her life and her death were not in vain. I had to push so hard on that advocacy. Right? And I guess I had known that all along. You know, shortly after we incorporated, I went ahead and I defended that thesis. It was not because I wanted to. Believe me, I had no career aspirations after seeing that steep survival curve. I didn't think there was a future for me, so why bother? I defended that thesis so that I could have the three little letters, PhD, follow my name, so that when I reached out to strangers, I could be Corey the scientist and get replies so that I could push on that advocacy. And it worked really well. I did, I was able to be Corey the scientist to colleagues. I was able to be Corey the patient with my peers who were helping me. And I was able to gain some traction. And the longer I lived, 
the more feasible it, it became to think maybe there would be next steps in my career. Maybe I would live long enough to make some type of impact. The way that I pursued it was by doing postdoctoral studies in cancer immunology, which is an incredibly promising field. It is saving lives right now. We have a lot of work to do, but it's really, really phenomenal. My studies went very well, and I had the door open to have my own lab and to basically chart my own path. But I took another step back because I, my, my thought was that I could become a scientist, have a lab, study cancer immunology, and maybe tack on a sub-study on angiosarcoma. But that same question lingered. Is that really going to have an impact? Is that really going to save people's lives? And the sad and unfortunate reality was that I had the same answer. Probably not. No, right? No. So at this time that seemed so depressing, an unbelievable opportunity presented itself to me. The Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, which is known for doing massive scale science, they're known for the Human Genome Project, they're known for collaborations that span hundreds of labs. We're, they were looking to do something novel and innovative. They wanted to accelerate the pace at which we conduct cancer research. And they wanted to do it by getting out of the old model of research, by going away from the brick and mortar institution where a scientist comes up with an idea, then they get funding for that idea. They generate preliminary data for that idea. They then study some patients. They then publish the tip of the iceberg, and the rest of that data stays behind um, some silo. They wanted to do away with all of that and partner directly with cancer patients and ask a simple question. Will you join us? Will you build this with us? Can we go down this path together? And can we build a resource that we can share with the entire biomedical community so that everybody can look at it all at once. It was a pretty simple idea, but it was pretty radical. Nobody had done this before. They needed me to come. They needed somebody who understood what it was like to be a patient. They needed somebody who understood the world of advocacy, and they needed somebody who happened to be a postdoc level cancer research scientist. When I saw this opportunity to help them conceive of and launch the metastatic breast cancer project, I jumped at that opportunity, and it was the best decision that I have ever made in my life. I joined back in 2015, and together with Dr. Nick Wagley, we launched this project. But before we launched this project, he said to me, if we can do this and we can do it well, what would you think about doing this for angiosarcoma? And I'll tell you what, Lauren had only been gone for a couple of months at that time, and it took everything I could, every, every part of me not to cry, right? I wanted to crawl back in time so badly and tell her, look at what you did, look at this, look at where we are, we're at the threshold of real change, of real impact, and it's all because you started that group. And it's all because so many people, just like Lauren, started their other groups. And now I was gonna work with some of the most powerful, intelligent people in order to go tap on those doors and say, hey, will you join us? and build this resource for the world, right? It was pretty unbelievable. So we launched this project in October of 2015, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project, and over 4,500 women and men, because men do get this disease, have raised their hand and said, I want to be part of that. I want to help accelerate research. They took it upon themselves to allow us to obtain copies of their medical records, their saliva. We collect their their tissues that were used for diagnostic purposes. We do genomics research on them. We couple that with the deep clinical information that we can find in their medical records, but maybe more importantly, that they provide with their voice because we simply ask them. Okay. Patients are so enamored by this process that, that we would ask them to help us build it, that they take it upon themselves to spread knowledge about their involvement in this disease in social media. They take the kits that we send them for blood biopsies, and they take selfies and they post it, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and they tell other people just like them, other people in those same groups, come, help me, 
Let's, let's all get together and let's help the next generation. Let's help our brothers. Let's help our moms. Let's help our babies never have to walk down this path. And it's amazing. It's been just over a year since we launched the Angiosarcoma Project. 300 people a year get this diagnosis. 300, a handful. And in that time, since we've launched, we've had 315 people sign up for our project. We've already generated data and put it out in the public domain, and I was able to present it to a group of sarcoma doctors. And when I did, we talked about the shared learnings and the insights from just 12 patients' data. And these doctors sat there, and I watched a clinical trial be born. And they used the data in the discussion right there in front of me. And I realized this is what true impact looked like. This is what it felt like. Things that were happening in that room were going to directly impact my friends that were in the group that I would go and be able to tell, hey, there's a new treatment option for you. And it's going to happen as, you're, as a result of your participation. It was pretty unbelievable. Right? I've learned so much through these processes, so much professionally, so much personally. You know, on a professional level, I've learned that patients are the biggest stakeholders in our collective efforts to thwart their disease. And if you ask them to meet you halfway, they are going to run you over on their way to meet you more than halfway. You know, we, the patients, will, we will participate. We will do anything to champion our disease as long as you, the scientists, will ask. And we, the scientists, have so much to learn if we will open our ears and listen to what you have to say. On a personal level, I think I probably learned the most by watching my children being raised in a world of cancer. Right? I always thought when they were that little that it was so important for them to know who I was. That's why I took all those pictures. But I think what I've realized that it was more important for them to know who they are. They are so lovely in this world. They live by the golden rule. They go to anybody who needs help if they even sense that there's a problem, right? They know that when you're faced with issues in this world, you don't just do something, you do everything, and then you do some more. They know that no matter how hard things can get, you put one foot in front of the other and you keep moving no matter what. Thank you. <laughs>